Very good. All right. So welcome, everyone. Good to see both folks here in the room and folks online. Yeah, this is great. So, <laughs> so I've been trying to get a hold of our proposed speaker, Chris George from Octopus Energy or Octo Energy. And initially he said he was gonna be available for tonight and now it, I believe he's not available anymore. So unfortunately we won't be able to hear about the V2G, the vehicle to grid because that, pilot that I know that Octopus Energy is working on is really exciting, but I'm not sure where they're at right now with that pilot. And uh, so we, we will uh, hopefully get a hold of him and, and have him talk at a later point in time. So for the recording, today is February 9th, 2023, and this is great to be here at TXRX again. We appreciate getting the space from those folks, so thanks to TXRX. And uh, it, it's real exciting that we have some of our own members ready to talk tonight. So we've got Fred, who's going to talk about his upcoming Prius battery replacement, moving to lithium ion. And he hasn't done it yet. So this is going to be a before and after. So this is really good. He's going to tell us about uh, what he's planning on doing. And then we'll, we'll hear about the things coming up. And also we've got um, uh, also our own member who, unfortunately, it's kind of a sad story, but I think it's very educational for all of us. Eric Sweet uh, suffered from the tornadoes that went through the Houston area recently. So they hit uh, Pasadena and Deer Park and uh, some areas around there. And probably folks saw some of the bigger buildings on the news, apartment buildings and so forth. And Eric told me that his house is right across the street from those apartments. And uh, you'll see in the photos that he brought uh, just what damage he had at his house. But all the people are all okay, right, Eric? Yeah. Uh, so I believed. I just wanted to confirm that. <laughs> so, yeah, Kevin. The question is, were any EVs hurt? <laughs> So, so a flesh wound on the hybrid, but no full EVs got hurt. Okay, good, good. And uh, then also I can talk a little bit about, um, so one thing real quick, just so that the folks outside noticed, uh, in case they noticed a new Model Y, I got a, a new Model Y that's out in the parking lot and five of us carpooled here today. So that was really good. Uh, yeah, that's one of the happy things. <laughs> and another happy, yeah. <laughs> and, and another happy thing is that we just had the big uh, North American organization. Um, somebody move over there by the, the lights. They, they tend to go out when nobody moves often enough. And uh, we had the, the big uh, meeting, annual meeting, and that was really fun. My wife and I went out to that. Hopefully some of you folks were uh, tied in on that because they also did that hybrid, like what we do, our local meetings here. And uh, it was at the Aptera location, which is in Carlsbad, California. And after our other uh, participants here talk about their things, then I can show you a few few pictures out there. And uh, the, then just as a extra at the very end where I happened to, so I mentioned picked up a Model Y. I picked that up on January 31st. I had it in inventory and I had to go down with my son to Brownsville to pick it up. And if anybody's familiar with what uh, somebody who's really big at uh, with EVs is also really big with some rockets, in particular one called Starship. And uh, it, say again. Oh, they lit 31 engines today? Trying for the, yeah, I was going to say 33 is the number I had in mind. So the, really 31 out of 33 would get into orbit. Okay. Well, because of needing to pick up this car in Brownsville, you go down Highway 4 to the Boca Chica State Beach Park and you drive right next to these really big rockets. <laughs> really impressive to see. So I brought a few pictures. You can see better pictures on the internet though, but we don't get to them today. Um, so that that's just kind of the significance there of, of having picked up the car. 
So, yeah, Kevin. Is it Texas, Hawaii, or is it? it it is. You, and I learned that you can tell the difference between Fremont and Austin builds by the VIN number. There's an F in the Fremont builds and an A in the Austin builds. And when you actually look at it, it was built in January last month, January 2023 build. I'm not sure. I asked about that and they didn't think that they did. And as far as what I've read, I don't think they're building model wise with the 4680s yet. Or maybe it's a small subset. Okay, so it may be something that maybe from the VIN number I can determine later, but the rolling the dice, okay. Because yeah, from the delivery person, they kind of led me to believe that it'd probably be 2170s, but they weren't sure. And yeah, okay, so Robin's saying most of them are. Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. So that's what I was kind of led to believe. Um, so yeah, they're just not making enough cells and Maybe the cells that they are making are all going into semi trucks, you know, or something like that. The semis obviously take a lot of a lot of cells, and they also want to get ramped up on the cells so that they can start putting them into cyber trucks. The, yeah, as Robin says, the limiting factor is the the batteries. And, okay, so to move on to other things, I'm just again checking that we're not hearing from Chris. Um, Okay. All right. Okay, good. And I've got a couple of folks as co-hosts that are helping me out with admitting and stuff, but yeah, key me in if there's something on the screen behind me that I need to be, um, uh, all right. And, uh, oh, come on. but just trying to see if we really will get Chris or not. And if not, we will just move directly to talking with our Ottawa folks. So let's see, first I'd like to bring Robert Sanchez into the conversation. Robert, would you like to unmute and? Good evening to uh, members and guests. And uh, right. thank you for attending and uh, Looking forward to your talk to see about the state of EVs in Ottawa. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Perfect, Robert. Okay. Um, so we're, we're starting off this year with our usual second Thursday meetings. And uh, is there any other general info before I get to talking about April and September? Okay. So the, the important things that I like to bring up for at least two meetings are where we would like to have volunteers come to show off their cars. So it involves both bringing your car if you have one and then talking to the public. So in April, the entire month is Earth Day. So it's a month, <laughs> but the actual Earth Day is the 22nd. And thanks to Colin, we are coordinating to do two locations this year. So we have done the Discovery Green location in the past in April. Usually it's whatever weekend is closest to the 22nd. And the 22nd is on the weekend this year. So I believe it will be on the 22nd. We'll confirm that before next month. But if as many folks as possible could put on their calendar to either volunteer for Discovery Green or the other location that we're going to do in April this year will be Ikea. And Colin has gotten a really positive response from the folks at Ikea. So this is really exciting that we'll be able to, to have our members or friends of yours that have EVs or friends of yours that just wanna talk, <laughs> um, even if they haven't bought an EV yet, obviously everyone's welcome. And so that is uh, a really big upcoming uh, volunteer event. And then uh, September is the National Drive Electric Week. And so we will want to have volunteers and we'll, we'll talk more about that September once we get, um, ah, very good, Colin. Yeah, he's, he's putting out the, the info here. So Saturday, April 22nd. So for the Discovery Green, the times will be between 12 and five. And one of the limiting factors there is that if you do bring your car in, which of course we encourage, 
you have to bring it in early and then it stays there the entire time because they don't want to have cars moving around when people are walking on sidewalks. And if we get the same location as previous years, we'll be parking on one of the sidewalks and people will be just walking right up alongside the cars. Um, it's up to the individual if they want to uh, let people sit in their car or not, or they could just keep it closed. It's up to them. Um, then for the IKEA location, the times will probably be between 9 a.m. and noon. And we'll see about having some cars up on the concrete apron and probably some cars in parking spaces. And we'll see what, you know, people who park out in parking spaces can generally come and go as they want. Um, so it's much more flexible. But obviously, I want to encourage folks who can come to uh, one or the other of those events, depending on where you're at geographically in town. Um, it's always fun. It's just really nice. <laughs> and uh, and if we can get a conversion, I'm looking at you, John, <laughs> that, that would be fun. You can pick your location, but it's always fun. And any other conversions? So Ken, if you can bring that fantastic uh, Sprite, that bright red Sprite, um, either location again, that would be fantastic to uh, talk to folks about. Um, I, I find always that folks are interested in the, the history of, of electric cars. And of course, we all know that we started out with conversions. And, and now, of course, a bigger proportion of the, the public in, in North America are, are buying their cars built as electric cars. And, and that's always a nice thing to have a purpose-built car. And, and uh, so hopefully Emma will be able to bring her new Hyundai out there. And that would be fun to, to have her talk about. To folks. So, so those are um, our two big events coming up for April. I'll mention it again in March. And we'll see whether we want to do a, an April meeting in addition, or whether we just want to do the Earth Day in place of our April meeting. We'll, we'll decide that closer in. Um, uh, because, hey, Dave. Uh, yes, Colin. Okay, so if you go to driveelectricearthday.org and put in mm -hmm. your zip code, do you, you get to... Uh, you get to this screen, hopefully, with uh, these two Houston events. Uh, okay. Uh, except if you're in Ottawa. Uh, uh, the, well, uh, well, we'll invite those folks to come on down. <laughs> the uh, road trip. <laughs> the uh, uh, if you want to show your car, you can uh, you log into this website and you uh, uh, can. Uh, uh, log in to uh, show your car, to attend, uh, to volunteer. So uh, do everything at this driveelectricearthday.org website. This is how we know Perfect. you're coming. Perfect. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, yes, people can uh, not only think about it, you can go ahead and get in there and register to be a volunteer. Um, so, uh, yeah, make your decision early. Good. And the, uh, <laughs> the discovery green is a full day commitment. You have to leave your car. You have to show up around nine o'clock and, and leave your car for, until five. They don't, they don't want people driving in and out. Right. Yep. That's, that's an important aspect of it. Realize it's a, a whole day commitment. So, okay, good. Um, that's all the general announcements that I had. So, Robert, I'm ready to turn it over to you if you would like to lead the discussion with our friends in Ottawa. And uh, we can go back and forth between the folks here in the room and everybody on Zoom. So, Robert. All right. Very good. Uh, once again, thank you for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, we always want to find out what else is going on in the big world of uh, EVs. So uh, without any further ado, I leave it to you. All right, thanks. Uh, my name is Mike Banks. I am the Vice President of the Electric Vehicle Council of Ottawa. I do have a slideshow. Uh, Raymond is on here as well with me. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'll share my screen. And uh, Raymond, feel Perfect. free to jump in at any time. Yeah, so uh, as Mike uh, shares his screen, uh, my name is Raymond Lurie, and I'm the, the president of EFCO, uh, and uh, I'm doing the most Canadian thing uh, that you can think of. I'm going to play hockey at uh, nine o'clock local time here, so that's why I can't stay for too long. Uh, but Mike will take us through uh, some of the things we've been doing over the last couple of years, and uh, you'll see that... Um, that we're, we're quite active, so so yeah. we're trying to have as much of an impact as possible. So uh, we are quite active. 
Yeah, can you guys see my screen okay? Um, Yes, we can. All right, cool. All right, so yeah, I'll start with an introduction of like who we are and all that. Uh, We'll do a bit of a recap for 2022. We did a lot of stuff uh, last year. Um, There was a direct request from Colin, I think it was, for EVs in the winter. So I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, given that it's very winter here. Uh, And then I'll take some questions if you guys have any. Uh, So without any further ado, um, we're a nonprofit organization. We got our start in 1982 um, with, you know, so probably like you guys, a collection of people who are like minded, who wanted to convert electric cars and were having, you know, sharing ideas and swapping parts and all the good stuff. Um, So, yeah, we're a volunteer run group of EV owners. Um, We're now dedicated to promoting the transition to electric vehicles now that you can just buy them. Yeah from automakers Um, but we also do support people who uh, do try and convert vehicles as well Um, evs obviously are environmentally better than gas cars they're economical they're available um, they're practical Um, so what we do is we offer test drive events Uh, we hold seminars and we uh, just try and promote public awareness through uh, engaging with the public Uh, we're we're motivated by (laughs) by decarbonizing our economy as quickly as possible. Um, This is an older shot of us, um, just a few of us with our cars um, at the Aviation Museum in Ottawa. And uh, okay, so talking about climate change, um, Ottawa learned a new type of storm, which you guys might be familiar with, but it's new for us. It's called a derecho, Mm -hmm. um, which the weather people told us is basically a horizontal um, tornado. Um, so that came through the city. Uh, one of the first things that happened in the spring was the derecho. Uh, normally, the May 2-4 weekend is a big party weekend for us. It's Victoria Day. Uh, so it's mostly you go to the cottage and you drink. Um, but not this year or last year, I should say. Uh, last year, we were you know, plunged into darkness for most of the city. Um, so this is, these are pictures from my neighborhood. Oh. Um, so this was down the street from us. Uh, the trees oh, took out a Honda Civic <laughs> and a couple ooh, of houses. Ooh. Yeah. Um, and that's Hopefully just, no people. No, no, people no I don't think anybody was injured. Um, just a lot of property damage. Um, this was um, one of this. The, the one on the left is on my street. Uh, took out her, her driveway and there was nothing in the driveway, thankfully. And then the other picture there uh, was blocking one of the main roads near my house. I was going to see my parents and I came across this. Um, somebody helpfully put a Canada flag on the tree so that we wouldn't notice that it was in the road. Uh, so that was very helpful. Um, but I, I broke out my electric chainsaw and chopped it up and made a lane so that we could get through and so that, you know, fire trucks and everybody could get through. Um, this is what our city, this is the grid, <laughs> the blackout map for our city. After 24 hours, um, there was significant outages. All the red is no power. Um and the hydro company was putting out tweets like this where they're, you know, we, we just got power back to the water treatment plant and hospital, right? After a day. So I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, they're focusing on critical infrastructure. They're not coming to our house anytime soon, right? Um, hospitals, that kind of thing needed power first. So um, yeah, so they were pretty busy for this entire week. Um, so what happened to me is I actually had received a Hyundai Ionic 5 in February. Um, late February of 2022, and I got the vehicle to load adapter. So I just plugged in my car to my house. You can see the extension cord going up to the front window of my house. Um, my car just happened to have 64% charge when the storm hit. Just It was charging at the time and randomly had that much in it. Um, turns out a fridge only takes 100 watts. Um, I didn't know that, but I do now. Um, so I could have run my fridge for weeks off the car. Um, so we didn't lose any food. And actually the neighbor across the street has a small child and a dog. And um, two days into the storm, he he went outside to start up his truck as a Ram 1500. And I was like, no, 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 no. I don't want to hear that thing idling for the next week. Like, screw that. Give me an extension cord. So we ran extension cord across the street, plugged it into my car as well, and ran his fridges as well. Um, so I didn't have to listen to his idling truck for, for days and days and days. Um, so yeah, we ran, we ran a bunch of fridges. We ran some lights. We had our Wi-Fi because children need internet, of course. Um, we charged up yeah. all our phones. Um, it only used 10% for the full week of, um, of usage, mm-hmm. you know, running critical, critical equipment in my house. And it only used 10% of the car's battery. Uh, so I was good to go. Um, and it turns out we have another EV, the Nissan Leaf. It's a 10-year-old car. Um, but there, there was a fast charger sort of two kilometers away from my house, about a mile, I guess, ish 
you're in old money. Um, and it still had power. So we could use the other car as our runabout um, and charge it up as needed at the, the fast charge station while our main car was running our house. Uh, so that was pretty cool. And a bunch of neighbors, everybody walking their dogs and you know, driving by, were like, what are you doing? How do you have lights and nobody else does? And this is why. Uh, so that's one of the things in EVs. Uh, I think I sold a few EVs right there that, that week. So that was yeah. pretty cool. All right. <laughs> Um, so yeah, lessons learned. Uh, vehicle to load adapter was the best two hundred dollars I ever spent. Uh, my wife, when I bought it originally, I bought it because I wanted to go camping and watch movies in the woods with the kids. And my wife's like, "You're an idiot. Why would you spend two hundred dollars on something like that?" And I'm like, "Cause it's cool. Like the car can run a TV. Like how neat is that? Like a projector, right?" Um, but then the storm hit literally the next week, and I, I ran our fridges and like we didn't lose any food. And she's like, "You're a genius." So I went from being an idiot to a genius. <laughs> <laughs> but, which was great. Um, that's that's what the derecho kind of looked like. It was like it was like a tornado, but very localized and came through. It lasted maybe two minutes, and in two minutes, it just took out the whole city. It was crazy. Um, and then there's a little quote from a building there that's uh, you know it's not a hippie thing anymore. It's a survival thing. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, so the other things we've been doing. <laughs> last year uh ev experience or evx and you'll see there's ve there that's the french version vehicle electric because we're ottawa bilingual uh, so everything mm -hmm. we do has to be bilingual which is cool uh, so we mm -hmm. we created this evx program uh to offer test drives to people so uh, we partnered with a few local agencies around town um enviro center being one of them uh, the hydro company stuff like that um and commune auto which is a car share uh service in ottawa and so we got them to buy five electric cars uh, to add to their fleet. Um, and in the past year, well, since they got the cars, I guess almost a year now, uh, they've done 921 random trips with people, like just members, that, not us. That, those are just like people taking the cars out and driving them. So 921 trips have been done in electric cars. And those are people who just happen to have a uh, subscription to Communato. Uh, so that's pretty neat. Uh, we did 22 community events, uh, test drive events. Uh, so that's all over the city. We, um, we would hold these events almost every Tuesday. We call them Test Drive Tuesdays, where we would advertise mm -hmm. them with uh, members of parliament and stuff, and people would come out, and we would just hammer out a bunch of test drives. Uh, so we ended up doing over 1,000 test drives uh, last year, of indi like individual test drives with people, um, getting people into cars, driving the cars, uh, you know, explaining everything about how EVs work and all that. And Enviro Center was keeping the stats for us, and they said we talked to 41,000, almost 42,000 people, which seems like a lot to me, but yeah, I could believe it. Um, we did talk a lot to a lot, a lot of people, so that was pretty neat. Um, this is some of the pictures. So that's the Communato car on the right there, the black one. It's a Kia Nero. They got five uh, Nero EVs um, for their rideshare fleet. Uh, that's Emma sitting in the front of a Model Y at one of our events, because you can. <laughs> um, and that actually attracted a lot of people. So that was kind of neat. Um, this is one of our other earlier events in the year um, where uh, that's my Ionic 5 there at the bottom. Um, but these, we were running test drives at this event here. Um, you can see all the cars out there. We had Bolts, we had Ionics, we had Ys, we had a Model S, we have an E-Golf. Um, and now we have mach -E's and stuff too. So that's, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, at one of the events, I uh, fed the volunteers with uh, my barbecue that plugs into my car. Uh, so I made hot dogs and hamburgers um, off the car. So that was fun. And uh, yeah, so the other thing we did uh, last year, well, it wasn't last year, it was, this has been a few years coming, is the e-bus campaign. So EVCO um, was, has been badgering the city of Ottawa to stop buying diesel buses and to buy electric buses instead. And we succeeded. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is the, one of the first e-buses. Uh, that's our new transit system, the train up top there, and then the e-bus in front. So that's cool. Um, but we also recently, like last week, got a tour of the e-bus facilities since we, you know, helped get them. Uh, so thanks to our activism, uh, OC Transpo is our local bus company. They uh, have four electric buses as a pilot project just to sort of shake out how they integrate into the systems. Uh, they're going to be buying 23 more this year, and the tender is coming out literally any day now. Um, they're going to be announcing who won that contract. Um, they are committed to phasing out diesel buses by 2035 for the whole city. And every new bus going forward as of last year will be electric. So they are not buying any more diesel buses at all. Uh, so all Excellent. new buses entering the fleet are electric. Uh, Near-term plan is 350 buses to enter the fleet by 2027. Uh, with the rest replaced by 2035. Unfortunately, they just did a whole batch of diesels. So there's a whole bunch of new diesels in the system, but 
uh, those are going to be replaced by 2035 as they age out. Um, we're going to push them to uh, actually do midlife refits to electric because the bus model they happen to buy also has an electric version. So we're going to see if we can push them to rather than refit the diesel, just swap out the diesel powertrain for an electric one. We'll see if that happens. But So they, uh, they can do that. They actually have a system they can drop in uh, to convert. Yes, in theory. So the, the buses that um, the city bought are called Nova buses. They're built in Montreal. And I think actually New York uses them too. But actually, um, sorry, sorry, Mike, they're, they're not. They're new flyer. They're not Nova. No, no, the 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 diesels. No, the diesels. About. Okay, the diesels yeah, are yeah. Nova, but okay. Nova Bus does make that exact model in an electric version. So theoretically, it should be possible to swap them out. Yeah, the the buses that they actually bought, the new flyer electric buses they bought, uh, those are made in Winnipeg. Um, by new flyer which okay. is a massive bus company so we're not sure what the 23 more buses are going to be from uh, that's up to actually the city of toronto for reasons um but uh, we're just going to attach ourselves we're going to muckle on to their project because uh, they're buying a whole bunch of e-buses and we're just going to attach like 23 more please um, yeah so, so yeah. <laughs> sorry mike so just to be just to be clear about that refit thing. So uh, the way OC Transport manages their buses, they keep them for 15 years, but halfway through the life of the bus, so seven to eight years into the life of the bus, they do a, a massive refit of the bus, yeah. which essentially they tear it apart and rebuild, and rebuild it, it and yeah. fix everything, replace the engine and transmission. And uh, that costs them a whole whack of money. And we're thinking that by the time the, um, you know, seven or so years from now, uh, we know there's already some some companies that do uh, retrofits to electric, uh, but we're hoping that the price uh, the price points will have diminished to a point where it will be uh, more advantageous for them to convert them to electric at that yeah. time than to refit them with diesel for another seven or eight years. Yeah, so that's our plan. Excellent. Push them Excellent. for that. Just 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 as a little data point, so kind of a little back and forth. So we've had some of our members talk to the bus uh, company here in Houston, and they talk about a 12-year cycle for their buses. I don't recall hearing anything about the, the major mods, although they obviously maintain their diesel buses, so they last 12 years. And they've we've just gotten a few. Does anybody know, are they actually out on routes yet? I know that Metro got a few, like, I don't know, 10 or so, or not that you've heard or seen. Okay, so maybe they've only ordered them so far or something like that, but Houston has... 1200 buses and they replace a hundred a year, if I remember right, on a 12 year cycle. So all their buses get replaced over 12 years. So we're hoping obviously likewise that they're they're gonna up the electric portion. But yeah. I just wanted to, while we're on this topic, rather than wait to the end. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Thought, thought thought you guys might be interested to hear what's happening with Houston. So a bit nice. slow. I love love hearing about your progress there with the electric buses. Yeah, and if anyone's curious, new Zombo Show on the bus, that's, that's what it says. Uh, that means we're hiring. It's in French. Um, so if you, <laughs> if you want to become a bus driver in Ottawa, um, they're hiring. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Michael. <laughs> Just a few other little tidbits. Okay. So right now there's an organization in Ottawa called Ecology Ottawa. And uh, our next project was to convert school buses to electric buses. Uh, but uh, Ecology Ottawa, which has, was one of the partners that helped us with the, um, the e-buses with OC Transpo, uh, they're, they're uh, spearheading a program to try to convert the, uh, the school buses, uh, which there's uh, that's a whole other question, but there's certainly a great um, ecological and economic benefits to doing that. So we're looking forward to having those uh, converted soon too. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've, I've always loved the idea of electric school buses. I mean, it's I've always thought it's terrible. We have the, the kids right there next to the exhaust pipe from these diesel buses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a few roaming around the city already, but it's it's a bit more of a challenge because they're decentralized. There's a bunch of companies that run school buses, but we're going to try and uh, get them to convert. Um, so the buses, right. the city buses that we have, um, there's two ways of charging them. The city has decided on the the one on the right. Um, so the, currently they use a CCS connector. It's a 150 kilowatt connector, just like you do for any non-Tesla car. Um, but they have the option of doing an overhead pantograph, uh, which also is 150 kilowatts. Um, so it's the same amount of time to charge the bus either way. It's just one of them takes up floor space and the other one doesn't. And so the city has gone with the overhead pantograph option um, because floor space is expensive. Um, and so they can mount it from the ceiling and have the buses park underneath. Um, each one of these buses uh, is projected to save the city over $50,000 per bus per year. Um, and actually that's old numbers. We're looking more at uh, $70,000 per bus per year now. 
uh, given that diesel got more expensive. Uh, and they take four hours to charge. Uh, so pretty cool stuff. All right. Uh, the other thing we so, do, oh, go ahead. I'll go back. I was just going to ask if you know if they do any opportunity charging, like when a bus driver has lunch for half an hour ah, and, and that way yeah. you, you can last a longer day and you don't have to, because one of the downsides we've heard is that the facility to charge a whole fleet of vehicles overnight is really tough to, to build and it's expensive to to do all of them. And so if you can opportunity charge, then you might cycle your other, your nighttime. Yeah. Charging. So actually the way Ottawa works, uh, they don't do any opportunity charging. The buses have the range to meet the full blocks of work that they're assigned to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're treated basically as a drop in replacement for the current diesel fleet. And the way mm -hmm. Ottawa's system works is um, there's, if you divide the fleet up into thirds at any given time, one third of the buses are out on the road. And then at rush hour, two thirds of the buses are out. Um, so there's always like a third in reserve. Um, and, and rush hour only happens twice a day, right? So there's a small window in time where there's two thirds of the bus fleet out. But most of the time, most of the buses are actually back at the depot. Uh, so they have lots of time to charge. Um, and we also have the LRT system now that's um, sort of making up the backbone of our transit network. Uh, so theoretically, that'll change the patterns of usage for the buses. And we're telling the city, you need more buses because you got to feed the train. Um, but so far they're thinking there'll be less, they'll need less buses. So that's another discussion, but uh, basically yeah. they don't need to charge midway through the routes. These buses can do 300 kilometers uh, to a charge. Um, and so that's enough for the full day's work. Go yeah, ahead, so, so on the opportunity- Let me, let me pass the mic to Jason for a question. So I had two questions actually. One was, you mentioned the LRG, is that electrified? It sure is. Uh, uh, track electric. Uh, well, oh, Raymond, the uh, other line is that's a different conversation, but yeah, the main, so, the main one, line one is twin track electric. Yes. Yeah. But unfortunately they're expanding the LRT right now and a portion of the expansion is uh, using diesel. So yes. we're very unhappy about uh, that. But it's, that's disappointing. It's yeah. only eight trains, uh, that part. I, and so I've seen a lot of buses with the overhead pantographs. Um, can these ones charge in motion or do they have to just like pull into a spot and put the pantograph up and charge once they're parked? They, they have pull to into pull into a in... spot. Yeah, there's yeah. a very special spot and they have a wiggle room. I think you said eight inches plus or minus each each like axis. Um, so there's a spot that they have to park and then the pantograph comes down. Yeah, so I, I wanted to make a comment on the opportunity charging uh, thing. So uh, the um, Montreal did a pilot where they had opportunity charging, and that was driven mostly by the fact that they were using Nova buses, which at the time did not have uh, long ranges. So they had buses that had ranges of something like 50 kilometers, which is about 30 miles. And uh, opportunity charging was required to be able to actually use the buses productively. Um, mm -hmm. The problem with opportunity charging is that the uh, the stations that do opportunity charging tend to be extremely expensive uh, because you're talking about wanting to uh, provide a significant amount of charge to a bus in a very short period. So the, the power required to do that is on the order of uh, 1 to 1.2 megawatt, right? So, so that requires a lot of infrastructure, transformers, all sorts of stuff um, to be able to, to achieve that. And that means that the opportunity charging stations cost on the order of over a million dollars a piece, right? So um, for that and for the fact that those have to be in, in fixed locations, so there's a lack of flexibility and uh, the overall cost of, of these, uh, these stations, we thought it'd be better uh, to charge in depot. The other factor is if you're doing opportunity charging, you're by definition doing some charging during uh, peak times or use peak usage times for buses, which happen to be uh, peaks on the grid at the same time. So you uh, are potentially adding uh, load on the, the grid at peak times, which in our certainly in our case, that means uh, burning natural gas uh, to produce the electricity in question. So we get a lot less benefits from reducing GHGs. So at night, we happen to have a large surplus of electricity uh, in uh, in Ontario uh, because we have wind farms and we have uh, hydro. That, hydro. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say, um, uh, I, it's worth pointing out that Ontario's grid is 95% zero emissions already. Yeah. Um, the reason we call it hydro is because power dams make up so much of the energy that we produce. Mm -hmm. Um, we also use Quebec's system, which is mostly hydro, which is mostly power hydro dams. Um, but we also have a significant portion of nuclear, right? So 
um, the gas is only about 5% of our grid and they only come on at peak times, right? They're peaker mm -hmm. plants. So they're hugely expensive, hugely dirty. Um, but yeah, our grid is actually very, very but, clean. But it's a small, small portion. So yeah, you're way ahead of so <laughs> many other areas. But yeah, I, I've yeah. always loved that you've got so much hydro. I think you even export a little bit to Vermont. And so we actually, we actually pay New York to take it from us because we make so much whoa um, yeah. <laughs> which isn't great like at night that's not good so we the, the hydro companies want us to have more evs overnight charging so that um, we soak it up instead of selling it to or paying the americans <laughs> to take it on <laughs> um and so they're actually talking about offering us a two cents a kilowatt hour ev charging rate overnight um off peak oh great um so great. we'll see if that happens or not but would, uh, would, would that involve a second meter so that they could separate out the no they, they have some sort of smart meter we already have smart meters and so they would have some sort of way to figure that out okay yeah, so, so just time of use so we, are, we already okay. we already have time of use uh, charging yeah. um there, there's two different ways that you could get charged for electricity in Ontario. But one of them is time of use. So the, the smart meters are already there to be able to do that. So it's not not uh, not a problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. And and I'd like to just bring up that since it was Jason who happened to ask that question, I always like to put a plug in for a better route planner. Yep. Are ABRT. you guys familiar with that? So, oh, yeah. Because J Jason has done some of the coding for that. So uh, oh, kudos awesome. to Jason for, for that. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks, and Jason. I see awesome. Curtis, you have your hand up. Do you want to? Yes, sure. Um, could you yeah. guys talk a little bit about the socioeconomic side of this? I know that there are three major issues that I'm concerned with that I'd like to see develop. One of the things that uh, your region is fairly um, forward thinking on is community mobility hubs. And that's beginning to take a transit facility and scale it down at the community level and look at multimodal mobility that incorporates EV from electric skateboards through scooters, through um, shared use vehicles, through community-based chargers. And with the notion of beginning to uh, decentralize and scale down the cost of EV infrastructure that is to implement. So that doesn't that always have to be a regional or municipal bond or some major corporation uh, making uh, EV accessibility happen. The, the, the flip side of that or the other side of that has to do with um, the actual maintenance uh, of EV vehicles, um, particularly through the advocacy of right to repair. And, and Tesla is, uh, has an economic model or a business model that many companies are beginning to follow that's anathema to the right to repair. And I wanted to get a sense of the conversations that have been going on in your region around this and how to think of this investment in EV to be not just an investment in centralized capitalization, but also decentralized capitalization so that we are spreading the benefit of uh, economic development associated with EV conversion um, throughout our communities. So, so Mike, I'll, I'll take a bit of a stab at that. Yeah, and, go for and, it. Um, and I, I'll have to leave in a few minutes anyways. Okay. Uh, but uh, Curtis, that's, I think it's the most complicated question I've ever received, but so there's a lot to unpack <laughs> there. But what, what I'll tell you is a, a couple of things. So uh, we're very concerned about uh, having an equity lens on the overall EV uh, and uh, particularly uh, EV ecosystem, but also particularly uh, in uh, ensuring that people who uh, are underprivileged have access to um, charging capabilities so they could enjoy the benefits of uh, paying less for electricity than they would for the fuel for, for a car, right? So as I'm sure you know, EVs are, are still uh, somewhat expensive and there aren't that many used options available. Uh, so we are very, uh, very... Um, uh, concerned about and 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 looking at ways to um, to make sure that uh, everybody in society could uh, enjoy the benefits uh, and uh, especially the economic benefits of driving electric, uh, because even though we do have uh, some transit in Ottawa, um, 
transit is not appropriate for some jobs. So if you're an Amazon worker, uh, the search a shift at midnight, uh, while taking transit to the Amazon uh, warehouse is probably not your best option. Uh, you know, especially if you're a woman uh, and you don't want to be uh, walking uh, in, in strange places uh, in the dark and all that, right? So, so we're really concerned about that. And um, transit in general, we're concerned about making sure there's enough transit uh, for people who can't afford uh, vehicles, period, right? So mm -hmm. um, so it's a really big thing for us, a really big concern. Uh, we're also uh, looking at reaching out to Indigenous communities, uh, First Nations, uh, to make sure that they also are able to participate in the benefits of all this. Uh, so I think that touches on some of the points you had, but uh, I'll, I can, I'll leave I can pick up a little bit as well. Sure, but um, I'll, ha I'll have to go. Okay, thanks. You, <laughs> thank you very much, guys. And, have fun, uh, Raymond. Thanks, thanks so gonna... much, Raymond. Yeah. Thank well, you, Raymond. Nice talking to you guys and yeah. hope uh, we could do this again soon. Okay. Bye. Sounds good. Um, yeah. So Curtis, um, picking up where sort of Raymond left off, we also um, like, I know we're an electric vehicle group, um, but we are very big on promoting alternative modes of transportation. Um, and we, that's why we're pushing the city to buy electric buses, right? That's why we're pushing for LRT to be better. Um, we, we believe like our city is already sort of on the path. Um, of progress where we're becoming less car dependent. We're building less car centric neighborhoods. Um, they're trying to build 15 minute neighborhoods is what they're calling them now, where it's everything's within a 15 minute walk of where you live. Um, so this is a thing that's happening now in Ottawa, but it's, it took us 80 years to get here right after the world war II, mm -hmm. where they started building everything around the car. And so it's going to take us another 80 years to unbuild the city and build it properly around human scale stuff. Um, so in the interim, like EVs are a component, but they're not the only component to this transition. Um, transit's going to be a big deal. Um, we have a lot of uh, scooters, um, like electric scooters around the town, around the city where there, you know, there's, there's a bunch of places around Ottawa where we can rent an electric scooter and, you know, toodle around. Same thing with e-bikes. Um, the issue with those is that they are very much three seasons um, and they mm -hmm. don't really work here in the winter uh, for, you'll see why in a few minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there, it's, it's a big hairy question. Um, and yes, it's, it's in our mind, we're trying to, you know, approach it from different angles. Uh, that's why we partnered with Communato for EVX, right? A car sharing service where if you, you, you might not necessarily need to own a car, you don't maybe can't afford to own a car completely, but you can pay a monthly membership and have access to a car. So that one time you do need to go to Ikea and buy a, you know, a bookcase, you have the ability to do that. Um, so there's different, you know, facets to that conversation for sure. Um, but we are thinking about it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, all right. So we also do uh, social events. Um, so we have our monthly meetings. Uh, so every month we have a meeting. Um, it's the last Monday of every month. Um, unfortunately, those are those can be a bit intimidating for people we've found, right? Because you're like, bunch of strangers going to a place to talk about EVs, kind of nerdy and weird. Um, so we've created a sort of a weekly social on a Saturday um, called Cars and Coffee, Kilowatts and Coffee. Um, it used to be called Cars and Coffee. Um, and for the winter months, we found a heated garage um, and a nice um, cafe, like a cafe uh, with pastries, a patisserie as they're called. Um, and so we, we hold these events and they're, they're very approachable, right? The idea is to be casual, you know, talk about EVs, talk about whatever you want. Um, and we found that a lot of people who are just curious about EVs show up. Um, and a lot of people who have a, like their first EV come and they're like, how do I charge it? I don't know what to do. Um, and it's, it, this kind of event is a very calm, casual social event. Um, so we find it to be a lot more accessible for a lot of people. Um, and yeah, so like I said, so this is just a random picture from one of our events, um, very relaxed, meet some members. So we have some regulars that come. We also have some, you know, um, new people that come. Um, that's so, the parking so you're garage. inside the, the cafe, you're not out at the cars? Well, so we start inside the cafe, right? Because I need to get caffeinated before I wake up in the morning on a Saturday. Um, so the first <laughs> thing we do is we meet in the cafe and have our coffees and, you know, meet each other and say, hey. And then we usually wander back over to where the cars are parked. We all park sort of in the same place in the parking garage. There's four level two chargers in that garage and they're free and it's free parking um, and it's warm. So it's an opportunity for the regulars to thaw out our cars and kick off all the, the slush that's frozen to the bottom of them um, and to, you know, check out everyone's cool car. Um, so even in this picture, right, you can see there's an EV6, there's an ID4, there's a Mach-E and a Model Y, and then my Ionic 5 is out of the frame. Um, 
And it's also for people who have questions about uh, conversion projects. So on the right, uh, that's one of our members, Alan, and he has Sparky, the electric ranger, um, which is a conversion project. And so we actually at one of these events had somebody completely, a, a complete stranger come in and say, hey, does anybody know anything about conversions? And Alan's like, actually, I drive one. I drove one here. Um, and so, yeah, I, that's my Ionic 5 giving him a level one charge because uh, we were actually pretty far out of town. <laughs> <laughs> that one he wasn't sure if he would make it home um but yeah so that was pretty cool um all right so uh, but before you leave that subject can you sure. speak to the question of uh ev conversions the economics and the trend towards that i'm i'm, I'm a big dreamer of a bunch of f-150s becoming uh lightning becoming thunderclaps and, <laughs> that nice. and that we we see a lot of uh late uh uh late 20s 20, say, I'd love to see a 2020 F-150 converted. Um, yeah, I mean, from our experience, it's extremely expensive, right? Because um, cars that aren't designed to be EVs from the ground up require a lot of engineering uh, to make it work, right? You have to figure out how to mount all the motors and all the battery packs and where to stuff all the batteries and all the electronics to make the batteries and the motors work. Uh, so it requires a non-trivial amount of uh, custom fabrication, custom engineering, um, and, and so that's, that tends to be expensive because you're hiring somebody to, you know, laser cut a bunch of aluminum or whatever the case may be. Um, so typically, um, people who do it tend to do it for like special cars. Uh, so, you know, like, like a classic, you know, 67 Shelby Mustang or something, right. Or a unique car. I saw somebody on the internet did, um, a Dodge satellite, Right, stuff like that, where it's it's like a passion project, and money kind of isn't an object in that case because it's like a it's a hobby that you're doing. Um, as far as converting more, you know, run of the mill vehicles like F-150s, I mean, I don't know if it's economically worthwhile because like Ford literally makes an electric F-150 now, um, so it might just be cheaper to just buy one. Um, but I mean, it's like th anything's possible given enough money. It's just economically speaking, it's probably not the best that that ford ranger um that alan has uh, that was done uh whew, wow almost like 20 years ago i think he said uh so yeah. it's super old and he's actually replaced the batteries already in at once uh from nickel yeah from lead acid to lithium ion um but they take up a big portion of the bo of the box right so like it's not a practical truck because <laughs> mm -hmm. the batteries take up so much room right and that's the issue right is that yeah if you want to have like practicality and usability, it's it's all trade-offs and money, basically. So, I mean, power to you. Uh, and I know that there well, are some companies that have kits, right? Like if you have Volkswagens, yeah. there, there's a, uh, uh, what's the one out West in California? Um, their, their name escapes me, but they have, you can buy kits, like off the shelf kits for like, if you have yeah. a Volkswagen bus or whatever, or a Beetle. Um, so those, those are definitely that, doable. Go ahead. Sorry. That, that, that latter point is, is my point that if, if uh, there's a, a small business out there that could focus on a range of a very popular vehicle like the F-150 and you particularly get a set of model years so that you mm -hmm. can engineer for that range of kit, um, those vehicles are going to be around for a while. And yep. the question around the economics of that making possibly EVs affordable, um, so rather than a $100,000 F-150 Lightning, you could get a um, $60,000 or $50,000 uh, F-150 Thunderclap that's done as a conversion kit um, aimed at a range of the market and that a small company does the engineering to develop the kit. And again, the conversion actually happens with a guy who normally pulls uh, a, a, an engine from an F-150 that, mm -hmm. that blows. So the, yeah. the question becomes, how do you begin to inject EV technology skill sets through a market approach into the small mechanics who are going to, over time, not have cars to work on? And, um, and rather than have the EVs end up with the corporate infrastructure is the only option for getting them fixed. So it's a, it, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's how, do, how do the enthusiasts support the thinking to build an ecosystem that yields an economic uh, framework that um, allows for that independence to keep growing. I mean, it might be possible. It would take a lot of number crunching to see if it's viable, right? Because, I mean, a lot of cars that are common, 
right? Like the Honda Civics of the world. Like nobody's going to pay another 40 grand or whatever to convert it to EV when their car is 10 years old already, right? They're not going to drop another 40 on it. They're just going to buy a hot new whatever, uh, EV6 or something, right? Um, so I'm not really sure. If there, there might be a business there. I'm not a business person. Um, but like it, it might be worth exploring, but I'm not sure. Um, if the numbers would work out, if you could have enough volume to make it worthwhile. Um, it's possible though. Like I'm, yeah, that's sort of my answer. Okay. There, if well, that well, makes thanks. any sense. I, I mean, yeah, no, yeah, it makes plenty of sense. I've, I mean, I've, I've been wrestling with just the point that you've made. Um, but and I, I'm, my concern in the larger sense has to do with this broader question of right to repair mm -hmm. and just the concern, you know, my brother has an EV and, he had to get it fixed and <laughs> good luck with that. That was a real pain in the butt. Okay, and, okay so I'm going to weigh in here. I just uh, visited our friend Google and there's a company in Montreal named Echo Tuned. Yep. That yep. back in 2019 started doing electric F F-150 conversions. Uh, and as yep. of the time of this article that I'm reading, they had done 15. Oh, so there okay. is already, so, there's somebody already out there that's done the engineering yeah. for the F-150. That's perfect. All right. Thanks, yeah. Seth. Yeah. The question is, Thanks, can, they, can they compete with Ford? <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all about sourcing yeah. batteries, right? So that's what at the yeah. end of the day. And, and Robert, I see you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I just wanted to know uh, what kind of uh, tax credits or rebates or incentives do the uh, provincial, federal, and local governments offer? I have a slide for that, so I will get oh, to that. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> all right, we'll get there. Um, all right. So if I can do I have control of my thing? Yes, we do. Okay. So yeah, I was gonna get to that in the next section here. So uh that's Parliament Hill for those of you who aren't aware in the winter. That's kind of what it looks like. We have more snow right now though than this picture, but whatever. Beautiful place. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so these are the non-Tesla fast chargers we have around Ottawa. So Ottawa, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but Ottawa is the blob in the middle there. Um, to the right is Montreal and to the left is Toronto down by the lake there, Lake Ontario. Um, and so the chargers are actually pretty well spaced. Um, where the words are, like the non-Tesla fast charge blue circle, there's nothing there. Um, so that's a, that's a provincial park um, or yeah, yeah, it's a provincial park. Um, so it's basically empty um, of people and treasures. Uh, so that's the non-Tesla charging network. This is the Tesla charging network. Um, there aren't as many dots because Tesla concentrates more at each location and they're the, like, they're only for Tesla's, right? So, uh, but they do have sort of the same coverage. Um, so we're well covered as far as fast charging goes in Ottawa. Um, and yeah, you can go basically anywhere you want in an EV here. Um, so federal rebates. So this is where I was uh, gonna get right to it, Robert. Uh, so right now, Canada has a nationwide $5,000 rebate for most EVs, well, many EVs, I should say. Um, there, there's a price cap on them. I forget what the price cap is off the top of my head, um, but basically if it's over a certain threshold, it's like, if you, if you can afford that, you don't need $5,000 from the federal government. Um, Ontario used to have a rebate, um, but then we elected a conservative government and they immediately removed it. Uh, so we have no rebate in Ontario. However, Quebec offers another $7,000 for an EV. Uh, so you get the five from the feds and then seven from Quebec if you live in Quebec, uh, which is right across the river from us. So a lot of people take advantage of that. Uh, so as a result, Quebec has a lot more EVs on the road than uh, Ontario. And uh, the only other province to have a rebate is British Columbia. And I believe theirs is $3,000, but I could be wrong. Um, and that's in addition to the federal rebate, which applies nationwide. Um, so right now in Canada for 2023, we are looking at a 10% market share for EVs. Uh, that means like one in 10 new cars sold in Canada will be electric this year. Um, last mm. year we hit 7% and uh, my projection is yeah, just over 10% now. Uh, so we are doing well, we're on the curve. We're on the, the steep part as it gets steeper and steeper. Uh, so we're well on our way. The hockey stick. All right. The hockey stick. How appropriate. We're going up the hockey stick. <laughs> All right. So, um, Colin, I believe you asked me about EVs in the winter. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so that is my thermometer outside my kitchen uh, last week. 
Uh, that's minus 30 Celsius or in your crazy units, minus 20, I believe Fahrenheit. I'm not really, I don't do, I don't do Imperial. I'm only you're, you're getting close to minus 40 and you hit minus 40. Yeah, and minus 40, matter. they line up. Yeah. I know that <laughs> the same at minus 40. Um, yeah. And that's without the wind chill, right? So it was actually minus 40 with the wind, um, but EVs don't care about wind. They only care about thermometers. Uh, so yeah, minus 20 Fahrenheit, I guess for you guys, uh, minus 30 for us, it's cold either way. Um, that's my snowblower. Uh, yes, it still burns gas. It's literally the only thing left in my life that uses fossil fuels. So that's going to be replaced as soon as I have $1,200. Um, but yeah, that's how deep the snow is. It is as tall as a snowblower, uh, which is waist height for if you're not familiar with snowblowers, because I know you guys are in Texas. So yeah, so that's a lot of snow. Uh, you can see in the background, there's a, there's a rope hanging from the tree. That is the swing, uh, which is completely buried. Uh, so the swing is actually like under the snow. Uh, so my kids are up to their, their chests in the snow. All right. So um, I thought this was a hilarious meme because um, it's very apt. But um, EVs have a lot of advantages over gas cars in the winter, as it turns out. Um, and take it from us, we <laughs> live in the cold white north. Um, they, get they get heat faster. Most of them have heat pumps. Um, uh, my Ionic 5 usually is blowing hot air at me by the time I reach the end of my street. So about one city block. Uh, so you don't have to wait for a big engine block to heat up first before you get heat in the cabin. You get heat basically right away. Um, they also preheat um, without polluting. So while it's plugged in in the driveway, you can turn it on or you can have it set to automatically come on at five in the morning or eight in the morning or whenever it is you go for work. Um, and I learned about this by accident when I got my leaf back in 2017 where uh, we got the car in May, and so I was playing around with the new car, you know, futzing around in the dash, looking at stuff and flipping switches and whatever. And I went to climate timer, and I'm like, oh, climate timer. And it's like, what time do you go to work? And I'm like, 8 a.m. And it's like, okay, cool. I hit okay, and I totally forgot about it. And then along comes November. And um, you guys might not be familiar with this, but here, uh, when you get that first hard frost, where it's like freezing rain overnight, and it's like really cold, the first time it's cold, and you're just like, oh my god, what you hear in the morning, the first thing you hear is people starting up their cars, right, to warm them up before they go to work, and then you hear the scraping, right, and you, it's an unmistakable sound of scraping, and you're like, oh, I'm not ready for this, it is not, I am not done with autumn yet, why are we scraping already, and so, I get out of bed, I put on my coat and boots and I go outside and I'm like in boxer shorts and a parka basically to go scrape the windshield because I'm like, I'm gonna get ready to go to work, right? Um, before I go shower, I'm gonna do this stupid job and then I can you know, go have a shower. Um, so I go outside, I look at the car and it's already defrosted, like no ice on the windshield whatsoever. Everything else is covered in ice, but not the car. And so I turn around and go back inside. And my wife's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, nothing. And she's like, well, why aren't you scraping the windshield? I'm like, oh, I don't have to. And she's like, what do you mean you don't have to? I said, oh, well, I, I set up the climate timer like way back in May and I totally forgot, but like the car's all warm and ready. Like it's, there's, I don't have to scrape the windshield. She's like, what? We don't have to scrape the windshield anymore? Are you serious? I'm like, yeah, apparently like the car just does it. She's like, that's it. We live in the future. Electric cars are the best. How come nobody talks about this? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, right. So, so yeah, that's, that's how I learned about that. Um, the other things with EVs that it's really good in the winter is they have a low center of mass, right? The battery's usually in the floor. Uh, so they handle very well and the weight is evenly distributed. So even in the F-150, right, um, the electric version handles better in the snow than the gas version, right? Because the gas one's usually rear wheel drive and there's nothing in the bed most of the time. Um, whereas the EV version has the battery between the wheels. So it's basically 50-50 weight distribution, which means you always have weight on the drive wheels. Um, so you have less fish tailing, uh, which is awesome. Uh, you can idle them for days. Uh, I know there was an incident last year where we got a lot of questions from scared people about um, something happened in Washington. I think there was like a, an accident on the beltway or whatever, and people got stranded for like seven days or something crazy on the highway in the winter. And everyone's like, oh my God, what happens if you're in an EV? Turns out uh, the climate system in an EV uses a few hundred watts once you're up to temperature. Um, so you can idle that EV for days. Like I did the math and it was like seven days. Like you could sit in your car entombed in snow and be comfortable and happy. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're going to want to eat and drink stuff, but like as far as dying from exposure, you're good. Like the car will take care of you and you won't die of carbon monoxide poisoning. So that's a bonus. Um, yeah, and kind then, of yeah. have a, a personal story of something <laughs> like that. 
last, uh, whenever it was 2021, we had the mid February freeze. My mm -hmm. son and I were at home and the power was out at the house. So we just got in the car in the garage, the EV, and we were ready to sleep all night, you know, and had the seat warmers on and yeah. Toasty warm, <laughs> right? So good. Um, the range does suffer a little bit in the winter. Um, it's a bit of a complicated question, really. Um, and like I said, it can be mitigated, right? And it's all about heat management, right? So most cars, except for the Leaf, have active thermal management of the battery pack, which means they'll heat up the battery and they'll cool it down, right? Um, so basically the worst hit to range you get is when you cold soak a car overnight at minus 30 and then you turn it on and expect to go on a long road trip. Like that's the car is going to be like, no, nah, you have like a hundred kilometers range today. Like you're, you're done. Um, but the thing is, once you start using the car, it warms up, right. And you get that heat into the battery from using the battery and it starts unlocking the range. And if you're on a road trip, for example, the only consideration you really need in the winter that changes how you would do it is you would just plan your first charging stop a little bit earlier than you would in the summer for us. Um, and so you would build up the heat as you're driving and charging. And then once it's up to temperature, you're back to basically summer range, right? So the, the range hit in the winter is really only applicable to a lot of short hops. Like if you're doing a lot of short trips, that's when you'll suffer the most from range. Um, from the winter but if you keep the car warm if you do the preheating thing for example and if you charge it up overnight and you time the charging to end just before you use the car uh, then the range hit's actually not that bad at all um, so that's something that uh, we learn the hard way sometimes um, but we try and talk about as much as we can it takes a little bit of a like a changing and thinking but it works uh, what else do we have so yeah this is raymond's model y in front of parliament hill and that's my Ionic 5 uh, in my driveway with the leaf behind it there. Um, and then, okay, so we also do social media. So we have uh, Mastodon. We used to be on Twitter and then things happened with billionaires and stuff. Um, so we've stopped using Twitter basically because they stopped supporting the app I was using and the, the native Twitter app is garbage. So anyway, I moved on to, that, to Mastodon. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel. Um, so we're there and I'm just gonna check the chat. What are the barriers and objections to the general public purchasing EVs on mass? Costs, range issues, infrastructure? Um, did you want me to answer that or? Yeah, if you could, that, that's a question in the chat. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, barriers and objections. Uh, barriers, I think right now would be cost mostly and availability, right? You can't just go to a car dealer and have an EV on a lot sitting there ready to go. Uh, so people, like if you want an EV, you sort of have to decide what you want and then wait for it, uh, which is definitely a barrier. Um, objections to general public purchasing EVs on mass. What, what do you mean by that? Did I get some clarification? So large numbers of EVs being bought. So public entity versus private owners. Hmm? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. So Rob, Robert, do you want to clarify what you wrote in the chat? Uh, basically, like, when will it um, reach parity with uh, combustion cars, internal combustion cars, where you just go out and buy it, <clears throat> and uh, you, they, they don't have to just think about it? Oh, okay, okay, like cost parity and availability parity, basically. Um, Based on like, I, okay, so I work for Statistics Canada, just as an aside, and um, as a hobby, it's not something I did for work. Um, I sort of ran a projection for EV market share. Um, and my model, which is just a standard model I stole off the internet, um, is predicting the end of this decade, so 2028-ish, um, EVs will have one in Canada. I think the US, you're a couple of years behind us. Um, but for Canada, at least, um, we're looking at like 2030, it's game over basically for gas cars. Um, nobody's going to want them. They won't be, you know, there won't be that many on the market. It'll basically be like EVs everywhere and the availability should be there. So that's according to my model. <laughs> um, so far, um, I, could, I didn't put it in the slideshow because I didn't think anybody would be interested, but um, I made that model in 2017. And I ran the projection and it gave me this, you know, 2033, I think is the mark, like saturation date where it's like, okay, game over, like 100% of car sales are electric. 
Um, and I thought, okay, that's cute, you know, whatever. And then I started plugging in real world data as it came in every year uh, since 2017. And we've actually been outperforming my model's predictions every single year, including during the pandemic, uh, which I thought was interesting. So if anything, I'm a little pessimistic in my model. <laughs> so if you think I'm talking crazy, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty crazy too, but it looks like the numbers are showing us that, yeah, by the end of this decade, basically, uh, we'll have reached parity with gas cars effectively. Yeah, just talking about statistics, I just read yesterday uh, to bring another country in. In China, I think it was 25 or 26 percent of all vehicles purchased were EVs. And mm -hmm. China is the largest car market in the world now. And on top of that, their incentives from the government have just gone down to zero. Yep. So the, the chart showed like over the last eight, 10 years, whatever it is, and showed declining incentives. And now they're down to zero mm -hmm. and they're at that high of a percentage. And then of course we all know Norway is a very high percentage too. Norway is basically game over. They're done. Yeah. They're hundred percent almost effectively. They're a hundred percent, 90 something. Um, yeah. I mean, and so we're all on that trajectory. It's just how long that time frame is depends on the country. Um, I was going to say something I forgot. Yep, I got nothing. Train has left the station there. Train of thought. Um, but yeah, so we're, uh, anyway, we have social media. Um, we did the cars. And then, oh, I'm going backwards. That's not right. There we go. Next. Uh, we do have a buyer's guide, right? So I do keep track of all the EVs uh, that are on the market in Canada. Uh, they should basically be the same for you guys, except this will be in uh, loonies, not US dollars. So that won't help you at all. Um, and the ones that are green have uh, the rebates and then, you know, the ones that aren't green don't. Um, and the ranges in kilometers, of course. Um, so basically this is useless for you people, but for, for us, for our people, it's great. Um, and it's, it's basically a, a full list of all the EVs available. Um, people find it really helpful. It's a spreadsheet so you can download it and filter it and do whatever you like. And I, I put in a bunch of variables like towing capacity and seating and, and uh, you know, zero to 60 times because people care about that. Uh, we do zero to 102, um, but 60, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, questions. All right. Th those were great slides. Thanks so much, Mike, and thanks to Raymond. Thanks. The mic is picking up the clapping in the room. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> all right. So, yeah, let's have a, a few minutes of uh, questions here. Okay, and I'll stop um, sharing. Put them in the chat for folks on Zoom, or you can just speak up. And uh, let me pass the mic over to John here. Um, hey, I just wanted to say that it was a really great presentation and y'all were really well spoken. Oh, and that's why we gave y'all such hard questions. <laughs> so I appreciate sorry, it. Sorry, but we were really trying to flex uh, your, your brain muscle there. <laughs> so thank you very much. No worries. Thanks. I have a question. Uh, has anyone, any like sociologists or uh, long range uh, thought people, have they thought about, ah, is this going to become a ha have and have not society where people with means, you know, financial means have EVs and those the, you know, the rest of society can't afford them. And I mean, think about what we have now. It's like some of us have a new car every three to five years and there are people that are driving 25 year old cars and praying that they won't break down because that's, you know, they can't afford to keep them up. So I'm, I'm just concerned. You know, I don't know if anybody's done a study about that. Um, I don't know of any particular studies off the top of my head, um, but I did do like political science in university. Um, and I've, I've sort of followed the space quite a bit, obviously. Um, and it'll, my answer will be different than for you guys. Cause Canada's different, right? <laughs> Obviously. Um, and we're, we, we're putting a lot of emphasis into public transit. Like I'm always kind of amazed when I go to Buffalo, New York and how little transit they have for a city that's the same size as Ottawa. And I'm like, how do you guys not have any buses? Like what is going on here? Um, and that I understand from watching a lot of transit YouTubers now granted it's YouTube, but you know uh, that you guys don't have the same sort of level of transit usage or transit investments that we have here um, um like ottawa we just built a big ass lrt system and we're making it bigger already right like it's going to cover the entire city um in the next three years 
um, electric trains everywhere, basically. Uh, and that's just the beginning, right? There's a stage three that they're going to do too. Um, so as far as an equality issue, um, it's, it's going back to that whole multi-headed thing where um, we have like transit's an option that's electric. There's going to be ride shares that are electric. There's going to be um, community shared vehicles that are electric. There's the, the micro mobility like scooters and bikes and all that good stuff. Uh, there's the used car market. So just as it is now with normal gas cars, um, if you can't afford a new car, you buy the used one, right? And, and the cool thing about EVs is that they tend to last longer and be more reliable. So like buying a 10 year old used EV is not the same as buying a 10 year old used Honda Civic, right? Like a Honda Civic, you're like, okay, when's the timing belt going to break? When's the, you know, like what has the oil filter been changed ever? Stuff like that. Whereas with an EV, it's like, yeah, my 10 year old leaf is fine. Like, it's, like I've literally spent $7 on brake fluid on it in the how, past five years. How about battery pack replacement though? Well, so the battery packs, um, the, the leaf is special, right? I'll give you that. And the leaf is not the, the standard bear, but uh, most other EVs, right? The batteries are designed to last the life of the vehicle, um, which is 15 to 20 years, right? So you should get 15 to 20 years out of an EV under normal usage. Um, so I'm not really concerned like like having to rep replace an EV battery out of warranty isn't really a thing. Um, except for the leaf, the leaf is special because uh, it and it's a thermal management, right? Um, that's the issue with every other EV. They manage the battery, they cool it down, they heat it up as needed. Whereas the leaf doesn't do that, so it's all passive, um, and that's the issue basically. But for every other EV, like the Bolts and the Konas and the Neros and the Teslas and everything, um, I fully expect those to last 15, 20 years. Raymond has a 10-year-old Tesla Model S um, with minimal degradation. He has 300,000 kilometers on the clock. Um, same exact like original battery, original motors, right? There's very little maintenance to do. Um, I saw Colin, did you put up your hand? Did you want to say something or you're muted? Uh, uh, I have changed a, a battery pack on a, a, a Model X, a 2018 Model X, and I'm waiting on a battery pack for a, uh, a 2010 Roadster. So okay. uh, it could be that uh, hot weather is harder on the battery. It absolutely is. Um, but also, would that be a warranty repair, right? The 2018 X? Yeah, we are. The 2018 was. Yeah. 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 And like, so the warranties, I think it's the same for all of North America, where it's eight years or 160,000 kilometers. I don't know what that is in miles, but you got the idea. <laughs> Probably 100,000 miles. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, eight years for sure. Uh, you shouldn't have to pay for a battery replacement. And then probably if it lasts eight years, it should last more. It's just, I mean, you'll have the odd, you know, edge case here and there, mostly with Leafs. The Roadster, I'm not sure what their situation is. There aren't that many Roadsters. It's, it's just old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the newer, the newer cars are all, you know, automotive engineered to last. Um, our biggest concern here is rust, right? We'll probably lose the chassis before we lose the battery packs. Right, right. Yeah. But great question. Thanks, David. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi, Michael. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for your talk. And I'm a fellow Ionic 5 owner as well. Nice. The, uh, yeah. How you mentioned, did you order yours and then it came in? Uh, you had to wait for it to come in. Is that what you said? Yeah. So I pre ordered it um, 10 minutes after midnight when the order books opened. Um, I was oh. number 78 in Canada. <laughs> on the order book. So yeah, I, I waited nine months for it to arrive uh, once the pre-orders oh. happened, but yeah. Okay. And how available are they now these days? Um, uh, it's still a one-year wait list. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're very, very hard to come by. Yeah. I, I purchased mine in January of 22, okay. but I was looking for it um, in the December and a December timeframe because my previous EV was rear-ended mm. and I, in Texas, there were none. So I ended up um, flying to outside of Atlanta, Georgia to pick up mine and driving it back. So, cool. yeah. That's yeah, I know, I know somebody that, uh, so we had a, an EV test drive event in the spring, like back in May and she drove in my car. I guess I sold her on the EV, the Ionic 5 somehow. Um, and she immediately went like that weekend and ordered one from all the dealers she could call, like in Ottawa, she talked to every single one. 
And then when none of them had them in the lot, she started asking dealers around the province and she ended up getting one in August um, by huh. just badgering a dealer in Toronto. She like drove down to Toronto. <laughs> She's like, I don't care about the color. I don't care about the trim. I don't care. I just want the car. <laughs> and so she ended up driving down to Toronto in August and then drove it back and then messaged me. Like she sent me a direct message on Facebook I was like, okay, I've got my Ionic 5. Now what do I do? <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> That's do great. you have charging? <laughs> She's like, no, I don't That's know what great. to do. So, so, I mean, they are available and, if you hunt, but I guess, yeah. Yeah. And uh, one other question. So did you get a tow hitch, um, factory tow hitch, I guess, or have you installed one? Or are you even thinking about I have not. installing one? Um, mm -hmm. I haven't installed one, but uh, one of our other members, Sam, has an Ionic 5 as well, and he put a tow hitch on his. Um, mm -hmm. He said to go with the factory wiring harness, like the Hyundai wiring harness, but then he got like a third-party hitch installed, but he had the, uh, the yeah. OEM wiring harness is the key. Right. Yeah, actually, that's the same thing that I did, and actually our, our um, EV <laughs> members helped me install it. So Nice. Yeah. yeah. If, I have a roof. If you want to go back, look at Look, yeah, on, on uh, we have a set of our videos of past meetings at our YouTube meeting on the YouTube channel. And uh, you can, uh, if you care to see or someone else wants to see, we did the, uh, in the space where you can drive a car in here at this facility, TXRX, uh, Emma brought her car in and it was a great team effort. Many hands make light work. And uh, so that was really good. So nice. So if there are no other questions, questions we'd like to wrap it up you're welcome to stay on but we do want to show the uh photos that eric has to to show us and then have uh, fred talk a little bit for the before battery replacement on his leaf going to a uh, new lead acid so prius prius sorry <laughs> yeah 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 okay so any other questions for Mike? Like I said, Mike, please stay on. I think you'll find this interesting here too. Thanks. I but, might have uh, to go in a few minutes. I uh, got to put the kids to bed, but all right. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay. Eric, you want to come up to the computer at the front? So Mike, hopefully you can see us there. And at least in our situation, we have a little window with the... Uh, the room computer. So we'll let Eric uh, call up his uh, PowerPoint and you can. Uh, so let's see, we can slide this up, I think, and reach the stuff down here. Oh, come on now, that isn't what I wanted. No, don't go that far. Okay, so we go to, that's Eric's house, yes. Okay. Yeah, it was a lot of patents. Hey, and uh, one of the members mentioned how nice the, uh, the Ottawa website is. A really good job on that. Um, Thanks, so I think yours is better. So I'm thinking of this as kind of a project update. I, we started doing solar before we got our EV um, because I, I just didn't, I was looking for a used EV and, and I d didn't really see much on the market. Um, so uh, this is the Google Earth uh, picture of, of the house. The, uh, it, the house actually faces north and you see the, um, do I have a pointer? I do. Um, so this is 26 on the on the south side and 28 on the front. Uh, we did the not, back. We don't see a share. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> we only we only showed one picture so far.
Now we do. All right, very good. Okay. So this maximize on this guy. Oh. Yeah, it was down at the bottom. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Okay, so 26 panels on the back and 28 on the front. Um, when we built it, we did it over a three year period and, and the, uh, the first two phases were this backside. Um, and I, I put panels on this, the aluminum uh, patio cover here. And then the third phase was the putting up a carport and putting the, the panels here. The, this is actually a large array. It's a, this is six and a half kilowatts back here total and eight and a half kilowatts in the front, but they kind of equal out because of the angle. This is uh, actually a negative angle going towards the north because north is this way. Um, let's see if this will navigate. So this is what it looked like um, right after completing the, the second phase. And this is the patio cover and the, the panels uh, along the back. We took out a notch for the water heater flue and uh, the patio cover actually connects to the um, to the back door here, this sliding door. So uh, I was actually at the National Weather Center taking a class. We got out a little bit early and my wife called and she was really upset and she said, we just got hit by a tornado. And you know that sound when you fire a gun, you kind of have this ring happen. And so it was kind of like that. She said they were okay, uh, but the <clears throat> the fences were down and the back patio was gone. And I thought, man, I got panels on that. And she was afraid to go through the door and you know, kind of check out the, the back. So sure enough, she was good. It took me a while to get home. The streets were flooded. Um, but this is what the tornado did. So what it did apparently is lift off the feet off the concrete uh, anchors. And I don't know if it peeled it off when it went or if the wind got underneath it. Um, I did a similar thing that uh, Kevin did. My panels are a little bit higher than what you normally see. They're probably twice as high as what you'd normally see. And uh, these four panels survived, but you can see they were torqued really good and, and bent the, the frame. And then it broke my conduit going around here. We did it in two phases. So the, here's the two inverters for the back. Um, but we were really lucky. This is what was across the street from us at the apartment complex. And this is really isn't a very good picture of the damage uh, because it had this kind of damage all the way down the street. But if you'll notice, these two things are my solar panels. And there's the distribution box. And here's the other side. This is, these are wrapped up and there's a frame down here that you can't see. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I would like to get a closer envelope, you know, so the wind can't get underneath them. But, um, you know, we, we had a presentation from the Solar Institute in Florida, and they were showing houses that had, you know, mass, you know uh, where the decking had come off, except for the houses that had solar, and the, the uh, array had actually been held down by the solar rack. In our case, once it got started, it peeled, it, maybe the lug nuts need to be, uh, lug bolts need to be larger diameter. I'm, I'm not sure what exactly the failure, or maybe there was enough torque coming off of the patio cover that it acted like a kite and just pulled it off. Um, so this is the rack in the front yard. This is my house over here. So it actually came across at an angle. The rack is empty. Uh, all the panels separated as it came off. Oh yeah, this thing right here. This is a javelin stuck in the ground. And if... If we go back to the, actually, 
this is a hole, the, the siding right here, this is a hole in the siding of this apartment. I, I don't know what, what caused that. No, it's not the size of a solar panel. It's big. Uh, did I go too far? So this is my this is the back roof, uh, really where the panels came off. And here's a, a board that went through the decking. Um, yeah, I, I've heard about this. I've certainly never seen it. And then this is the the four panels. the The racking extended on both of these, and it so apparently it tried to peel it off and, and actually broke the the Unistrut. I, I see there's a joint here, so I don't know if there was a joint here or not that failed. This is the front array. Um, and the problem is that this panel right here got hit. So this one shattered. And um, so it hit right here and did the spider shadow scatter. So what we did, this, this array was, when I, I bought the panels first, <clears throat> I bought an even number. And then I got a really good deal on a 10 kilowatt inverter. Uh, but when we did the, the configuration tool, it recommended three legs. So three doesn't divide into an even number and um, in this case. And so I ended up with a spare panel. So this is the quick disconnect box, um, the rapid shutdown box. And I just mounted the panel over here kind of as a project panel. So I had a spare, so we swapped it out. Now it's over here and we're cleaning this out. I just grabbed the picture when I could, um, but we put the shattered panel back. And um, so this array is functioning again. And this array now is a project. So I, I'm not sure what we're, we're gonna do, but I wanted to give an update and, and kind of. Uh, We, we've talked to the insurance. We we expect that it will, but I think they have never done it before. So we'll see. We'll, um, they're dragging it. Well, we'll know in maybe two weeks. Yeah, so 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 this part ended up like a block away. It it it, it was a kite for sure. No, uh, it's this is Houston. Well, so when when she said we got hit by a tornado, I assumed it was an an EF one because that's what we get, and they rated it as an EF three. So I, I think that it's just when you get hit by a bus, it's going to hurt. <clears throat> Yes, it, yeah, it came through here. It was, this house got a little bit of damage. This, this other house got more. Where are we at? Oh. Yeah, and the, this, this roof got stripped. Um, so it came right through this, this path and it kind of went at an angle to the right. And when we saw the damage pattern, it kind of started in our neighborhood. The ho those houses behind us got hit pretty bad. And then uh, you could watch the line go all the way to uh, through Pasadena Deer Park and then out across the ship channel. Probably bound hopping. Yes. Yep. In the, room, in the room, they're saying nothing is tornado rated. So, Kevin, you said it could be a couple hundred miles an hour as opposed to. 
hurricane 150 or whatever miles an hour. Yeah, Easily, he says. A tornado. The, the, the huge difference is that with a hurricane, you have this massive area where you have uh, air moving um, across a very large area and you have what's called um, friction. Uh, the, the, uh, the speed of the wind goes down drastically as you get close to the ground because it's a big widespread area that's moving and there's a lot of friction on the ground. So you might have a, you know, a tornado that's got, like when they come through Houston, the, the winds, and you saw some of that damage in downtown where, where you had buildings on the downwind side had all the windows sucked out. So if you got, went up 20, 30 feet, you probably had 60, 70, 80 mile an hour winds. But down on the surface where you have one and maybe two story houses, the wind might only be going 40 miles or 50 miles an hour. With a tornado though, it's a localized spinning vortex of, of air that, you know, is only several houses wide and it's actually going down to the ground. So, oh, he probably, they, they probably had some kind of a sustained gust of 60 miles an hour. Right, right. Uh, so you have two things, right? You have the the very low pressure in the in the in that inside that vortex, which is a differential. But you also on the outside, if you watch tornadoes, you've got this big gust of wind coming off of them. So yeah, it's two diff totally different animals. Did, did your wife describe the sounds that she experienced? Yeah, so she said she didn't hear a train or anything. The they heard the the hail start. Actually, my daughter was at the back door uh, doing making a video, and you can hear the hail come down. And then there was a big boom, and I don't know if they were too close to it to hear the train sound, but yeah, it just hit. The video stops right when it hits. So, but they 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 ran in. I was really proud. They ran into a bedroom. They went into the right closet in the middle of the house, and uh, they did everything right. But he had it beefed up so that it could handle the panels, and that beefing up handled the tornado. The front of the carport to the back cover that blew away. The front carport stayed. Yeah. Yeah. So, Eric, we feel sorry for you. Hopefully, you all recover and everything. Good that your front array is working. So you're yes, the front array is working. The yeah. So when we did the carport, it was I could I got to see the the front one fail. So, you know, I beefed up the things that, that failed. It didn't have enough support in the middle, so it was kind of doing a wing thing. And then it was made of aluminum and it just ripped the, the bolts out where these aren't, these aren't gonna rip out, they're steel and they're, bolt, they're bolted to the ground. And so I kind of compared that to the back patio and it's kind of on my to-do list to figure out, I don't know if it would have made a difference, but you can see where it just lifted out of the footings and that was, that was the beginning of the end. Okay. Any other questions for for Eric? We'll uh, we'll keep moving on here now. Ah, online. I, I, sorry, I had a briefly had a question related to storms and EVs. Uh, what happens when you drive an EV into a flooded street? So, who who would like to answer that? I could say some things I've read, Kevin. I have driven my uh, a leaf and a bolt in water over the wheels. Over the wheels. I I, I actually drove through our neighborhood um, uh, with a, with a a friend of mine, 
and just to show him how well an EV drives in water. I will say this, a couple of things. One is um, the, you, you don't want to run the air conditioner too much because it, it does, it does the, the water covers up the front uh, radiator and um, you, 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 you won't suck any water in the car, but you, you get a lot of uh, debris uh, clogging up the radiator. That's, that's it though. The water pressure hold, push on the door is even harder. You don't want to open the door if you're sitting in high water. Uh, what, what gets, you know, a gas car, the, the biggest thing that gets a gas car is that the air intake is up in the, uh, under the hood in the front. And folks have a tendency to not want to stay in high water. They think that maybe the water is going to cover up the tailpipe or something. So they speed up in the high water. And when you get that bow wave on the front of the car, the water goes up into the intake and it kills the engine. That's that's what gets gas cars the most. But electric vehicles are they're all sealed now. Um, obviously, we have flooding, and if you have a car submerged in water, the water will eventually get in because uh, it's more of a water resistant component than uh, that. That might be. Anyways, I've driven a couple of them. They drive just fine. Thanks. And there's, so there's no risk of shorting out anything. No, you don't need to worry about that. Some Someone said about floating, so that can be different for different cars. So, okay. Well, <laughs> that that was a good topic there. Again, sorry, Eric, to hear about your, your, your household loss. He just said it is what it is. So, okay. Battery, Fred. Do you want to come up here and we can have you just show it in front of the camera right here? So right there. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I bought a 2012 Prius um, new. Uh, it was my work car. I covered a 17 county area as a food manufacturing inspector. And I love the car. I mean, it's been a great car, but lately I started getting error codes and my son helped me determine what that error code was because he found Dr. Prius online and, and Dr. Prius hooked us up and I found out it was a change your uh, battery, uh, your traction battery. So then I went online and searched around for batteries. And of course, everything I got was nickel metal hydride for $2,000. And then I was in the middle of looking at all that. And I get an email from John and he says, why don't you just go lithium? I went, lithium? He said, yeah, yeah, you need to go to this next cell site and uh, check out their lithium batteries. They have them for the Prius. So I checked it out. I even called the guy, the guy that runs the operation, Jack, called him up, asked him a few questions, asked him, well, I didn't call him up, actually texted him. He texted me right back and said that he had them in stock, could ship it right away. So I ordered it the, the next day on Thursday and I got my batteries on Tuesday. And this is one of them. There's 10 of them. I'm in a Prius C, so it's got 10 of these. A regular Prius has 14. Um, he sent videos on exactly how to do the swap and everything. And supposedly I get more mileage out of when it's on EV mode. Uh, I can get three miles instead of about a quarter of a mile. And, um, supposedly my, my mileage uh, will go up. Uh, my mileage is always about 50 miles a gallon riding around town. Didn't matter where I was going 50 miles a gallon. Now that my battery is low in the last six months, I'm, 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 I'm getting about 44 miles per gallon. So uh, then John showed me how to do a, a uh, test on the uh, battery um, and uh, on the batteries in the car and the life, life expectancy of the battery was 41%. And they said at 40%, you get the big notice that you have to change your, your uh, traction battery. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like 
do it. You're going to get stuck if you don't. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I learned a lot. I've learned a lot about uh, electric. You know, I'm doing this electric thing one tiny step at a time. So I'm going from metal hydride to lithium. Of course, the next step will be fully electric, but I don't know when that'll be. Um, but anyways, um, what was I going to say? Um, but this is the new, uh, what is it, iron phosphate? A PO4 battery. So this is the new... Uh, technology for lithium it's supposed to be safer and like i say the guy had them in stock sent it to me right away no big deal and uh it looks like the swap is not that complicated so next time i'll tell you how it went questions yeah you're going to change all of them yeah they said don't don't try to do don't try to add this in to some of your nickel metal hydrides. No, you just swap them all out. They're incompatible with each other. Any other questions? What? Yeah, question online. Uh, this one was 16.4 volts right now. I, and they were all, all 10 of them were the same. Yeah, they are exactly the same. So he wanted, yeah, so 160 volts total. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what, what, what was your all-in cost? What, what's your all-in cost on the replacement for your oh, choice with? Oh, uh, yeah, they wanted versus, for the uh, cost the other way. Uh, for the nickel metal hydride, they wanted two thousand dollars. This was uh, seventeen no sixteen hundred plus a hundred dollars shipping. And I went ahead and bought some $80 high voltage gloves, which the guy that sold me this battery says, you don't need those. So anyways, um, so that's my investment so far. Yeah, I just, well, it's actually easier on the Prius C than it is on the regular Prius. Cause in the regular Prius, they managed to put the battery right underneath between the back seat and the trunk. So you have to take out the back seat the back seats and the trunk pieces, whereas mine's totally under the back seat. And it's uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's all just right there. I'm 135. And, and they say that possibly the reason mine is because I have a friend that has a 2000 and, uh, 2008 Prius with 250,000 miles. He's on his original batteries. But um, uh. You know, I they say that the hot weather has a real toll on these batteries. So and and not so much. Supposedly, this is supposed to be better as far as handling the heat. Oh, and the other thing, but I have learned a few things here. I learned that uh, corrosion on the little uh, uh, on these little uh, things that contact here, those have to be taken off and soaked in vinegar before I put a new battery on. And the other thing I learned is that. The Prius has a tiny fan that comes on, computer tells it to come on to cool the battery when it gets too hot. Nobody knows that fan is there. It's not in the manual or anything. You're, and this guy's telling you, you should clean that fan every time you change your oil. <laughs> Mine's 10 years old. I don't know what that fan's going to look like. <laughs> yeah, he showed, a, he showed one from a five-year-old Prius and the fan was totally clogged with debris. Because it depends on where you drive. So that could be another reason why my battery is prematurely failing. That, that could be a difference in one car to another. Yeah, it could be. Anyway, any other questions? Oh, okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Jason, just it. So yeah, Jason just added computer fans are like that too, would blow them out the dust and everything. So this battery is half the weight. Uh, this battery is half the weight. The uh, 10 batteries all together is 80 pounds. And when this battery, it'll be a little over 40. All right, very good. Well, thanks a lot, Fred. Sure. Okay. Um,
If there aren't, aren't any other questions, I'll show you some photos from the big meetup in Carlsbad, California. And then just to uh, end, I'll show you a couple of rocket pictures. <laughs> so a couple of fans here of, of those. So let's see if I can get to uh, my email and let me call up the email so that I get, because I stuck the photos in there. Yeah, I get emails from all kinds of folks. And, and that top one where it says GBS, that's Galveston Bay section. So if some of you get an email from me, you'll notice I've also volunteered to be the chair of the IEEE Institute of Electronics, Electric and Electronics Engineers, GBS Galveston Bay section. Yeah. So anyway, um, let's see if my photo is gonna come up. All right, so. Yeah, I'm trying to think of how I'm going to get it. If I need to do a save of each photo to the save picture. Okay. I was going to try to avoid. Yeah, I'll do that first. Let me. Uh... Well. Yeah, the uh, photo is not. Okay, except now, of course, it's sideways. <laughs> yeah. You... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, let me. Let me do my share screen here and come on. All right, so I'm sharing and this picture's sideways. We'll come back to it again. I'll, I'll switch it around. If, uh, but this is the, this is the Aptera. They've gone through an alpha beta. They're on a gamma version now. So they didn't have the gamma out there. This is a beta and they've changed things like the, they call these the pants on the front wheels. And um, so we got to sit in this one and we got a test drive in another one that doesn't have all its covers on it and things like that. So you'll you'll see that here in a second. So first, this is um, one of the Scottsdale chapter members had a wrap printed and then put on his car. So you see our electric vehicle association right there on the door. And I'd heard first the design was to have this reddish color at the front and this at the back, but then it would have put this logo on top of the red and purple. And our president said, no, you, you kind of have that on the blue. So maybe you can swap it around. So they did. So they printed it and it's specific, I guess, when you print it, what's the front, what's the back of the wrap. So, so this is my lovely wife in the Aptera and she was testing to see if she could reach the pull down door handle. So as you can see, the doors go upward and there she is again and so you can kind of see the interior it's got the center screen and it is a two-seater and it's very aerodynamic as you could see from that first photo and there's solar cells on the outside they said that you could get maybe about 40 miles if you had good sun well this one's i'm falling out of the car i guess this one's 90 degrees as well so me sitting in there and you could part of the windows here opened up so you can see me through the part that opens up. And uh, they're coming out first with a launch edition that'll have 400 miles. Eventually they wanna come out with a version that will go a thousand miles because it's so aerodynamic. So it was interesting, Chris, one of the co-CEOs was talking and they've made the design so aerodynamic that 
somehow there was a conversation about the F-150. Oh, it was about mirrors. Okay, so they would like to have camera mirrors, but so far those aren't legal in the U.S. You have to have physical mirrors, which of course give you a lot more wind drag. So then the, what made my jaw drop was that he said, the large mirrors on the sides of a Ford F-150, just the mirrors have the same drag as this entire vehicle. <laughs> That's how aerodynamic they made it. Wow. It's really slippery. Really slippery. So at the front, they have a part of the front has the radiator behind it. So you're not actually running air through the fins of a radiator. It just goes over the surface to give it cooling so it can cool the batteries and electronics and such. So yeah, that it's just really a marvel what they had there. Um, this is their little symbol for Atterra on the side, but you can see all the solar cells here on the top. So it's 700 watts, they said, of solar cells. And as you can see, a good crowd there. Uh, we all had badges and the president gave me lanyard and badge holders so we can use those in April. And they recommend printing the badges two-sided so that way you don't have to worry about a badge facing the other way. We can actually get a template if we want, but that would be good for April if we do that. So uh, here's kind of the back of this beta version. So I said, things changed a bit between the different ones. Of course, it's three-wheeled, which is why you've got the single wheel in the back back here. There you can see the side view from the right. And let's see, what other photos did I have here? Oh, this one's a little, we'll see if it plays. It's actually a little movie. Okay, we'll see if it plays. Oh, come on now, it's not going to play. Oh. Okay. Uh, it says, oh, I'm screen sharing, but. It... Oh, okay. So I need to change what I'm. Stop share and share something else. Okay. Share. This one. I want to. Do I want to share the video? Let's see if I can. Oh, actually, this is just a one second video. So yeah, it's not, not going to show, show you much movement. Um, if it's even able to, oh, there's the play button. Oops, now I lost it. Space bar will play. Oh. So that's, that's what. It it just proves that it moves. It, I I of course was just no, it's not downhill. <laughs> I like that comment, but but uh, so I got strapped in with a five point harness, and uh, their engineer is the only one who could drive it. Obviously, this is not real complete, but um, yeah, we went out on the the public roads, and. Uh, so it, it, they're, they're really making good advances. Of course, they are looking for investors. They say they need about a million dollars worth of equipment. And if they can get that, then they can start producing these in a year. Yeah, Ken. I was looking at their, uh, their website recently for an investment of $10,000 in addition to anything else you may have invested in them in the past. Uh, they will put you on a list and the top 2000 people off of that list ranked in order of their investment will be able to purchase the first 2000 publicly available vehicles. So it's not a down payment, it's an investment. So you, you buy your position in line, you can get one. So my question for you is how many of these things did you see? Uh, in the, the building there, we saw two or three betas and we didn't see any gammas. Yeah. So. I was just going to mention, I don't, I mean, you're kind of buying your place in line, but it's still an investment. You're you, still buying shares. You, you have a partial ownership in whatever comes out of the company in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So. Was that the factory, Dave, or was that their headquarters? That is their current factory where they want to get started at, but I think they have another building where they want to put in all the equipment for actual production. Yeah. Okay. Fred. Um, what's the body and the chassis made out of? 
So they are working with a company in Italy, and I want to say it's a type of carbon fiber. It is, okay. And it goes through all the crash testing and safety and, and things like that. So they were emphasizing that. I, everything went by so fast that weekend. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, in, in fact, um, so it was nice. We heard Mike and Raymond talking about uh, their new name for cars and coffee. There in California, they have EVs and espresso. So you have another E, yeah. <laughs> so um, I personally didn't put anything down <laughs> so, as far as investments. Um, I have a reservation slot that that was uh, $70, but uh, okay. So let's see. Say again. So let's see if I. Is he giving you a five minute warning? No, I'm. <laughs> your five minutes is up. Uh, I, I heard <laughs> that there was a, a Houstonian who got a lifetime achievement award at this. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, Colin. I wasn't going to bring that up, but uh, congratulations. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is the, the car people have seen those on the road, but seeing that the email down here from Kate, um, for, that's the other thing I do. I wanted to mention something else. It was great that they had the Evolve with the E and the V emphasized out at the auto show, as a lot of folks know, the auto show is put on by the Dealers Association. And so they've got different ideas about going slow on EVs as opposed to going quickly. So Evolve had a booth there. I volunteered on the first day because the second day I had to fly out to California. But it was a lot of fun that first day. So did any of the other folks here, Seth was waving his hand, Bill, Kevin, got out there to volunteer? Great, because I, I didn't check back. Yeah, go ahead, Seth. I was actually going to talk a little bit about their ride and drive. Because yeah. on Friday, they were a little short-staffed on ride and drive, and I spent about four and a half hours giving people rides. They had the F-150 Lightning out there. They had both a base model and a limited. They had the uh, three of the pole stars. All right. They had a VW ID four. They had a couple of Neo, uh, Nissan Leafs, which nobody wanted to drive. <laughs> and they had a Kia. And uh, I gave rides and everything but the Nissan Leaf because, like I said, in the four and a half hours I was out there, nobody asked to drive the Nissan Leaf. Really? Really? Huh. Right. And it was um, the new one, new version. Yeah, it was the new one. It was the new. It was the second generation one. But it was, and then on Sunday when I went back, I actually got the opportunity to drive a couple of them myself. Oh, good, good. So it's okay. really interested that yeah, I had an I I at one point had a reservation on the F one fifty Lightning until they started jacking the prices, and then and said that they wouldn't sell the extended range of the base model, and yeah, the base model would have met my needs, although. One thing I did notice is that the manual seat in the base model is not very adjustable. And I would have to get a power seat to be able to get it someplace where I could use it. The base model doesn't, but does one of the others? Oh, the limited was great. I mean, okay, okay. if I had an extra $90,000 burning a hole in my pocket. Uh, yeah. yeah. But it, it was fun. It was fun. And then VW had a booth where they had some of the ID4s. And I'm trying to think. Somebody else had had a booth where they were doing something. I don't remember what, who else had was on the uh, on the dealer side that was doing ride and drives. But okay. and, and Jeep had a couple of the uh, ex the, the the hybrids. Okay. Running on running on their course on the inside. Oh, okay. Very good. Very good. All right. Good. And yeah, in terms of other vehicles, I noticed that the Chevy display they had both the. Standard Bolt and the Bolt EUV just static on display. So that it was good that they had them out there. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and glad to hear folks got to volunteer and get out there and help evolve. It's always great to, to help Kate and her group out there. And uh, so, yeah, and just to finish up so we can 
let everybody go home. Uh, is it showing, I did a share. Do you all see some rockets online? Yes. All right. <laughs> so Starship and the booster, the, the rockets, one of the three on the right will get put on top of the first stage booster that's there on the left. You can see some control grid fins up at the top. It was a very foggy day. And so when you actually um, went to look at the launch tower, it disappears up in the fog. So, but it, it's just great that you can drive down this part, they've repaved and they actually were doing some work. There was a section that was just one lane um, because this road that used to just go to the beach did nothing else, is not in good shape. But here, right in front of where the rockets are, they um, repaved it. And uh, so there is as much of the tower and the, the first stage that you could see there. And uh, so, yeah, it was well worth it to go down there. You get amazingly close when you're at other, you know, places around. You can't get, sure. There were houses there originally, and I bet that's just a leftover from that. I've heard that most of the beach house owners have been bought out, but there's a few holdouts. But I think that the the ones that got bought out by SpaceX just get used however they want to use them. Um, it's not very long drive into Brownsville, um, 25 minutes or something. And so probably most people just live in town, but uh, yeah, the, and, and the thing that I always find amazing. So the uh, Texas state government wanted this facility so much, they actually changed the law because previously no state park could be closed due to the activities of a private company. And that got changed because they need to close this road, which means closing off access to the public beach when they're doing dangerous activities. And one side of the road has the launch facility and the other side of the road is where these uh, the rockets get built and they, they roll them down the road. And then, um, and you actually drive the road ends on the beach and you drive on the beach. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have it handy, but I have one photo of, uh, my son and I, we were actually on the beach. Let's see if I've got it handy here and we can, yep, here it is. Let me send that over to email and you can all see the car and the beach and us. And then that will be the last one. It's kind of windy as well as, like I said, with the uh, the fog there. It doesn't take too long for the photo to show up here. Uh, But in this, I just stuck three, the three photos in. I, I took a bunch more, but I don't know if this email is going to respond fast. I That's what I've been hearing. I mean, stuff is supposed to come up quickly. Well, maybe that's not going to come through. Because through the Ethernet, it should, should update. All right. Anything else that folks? Yeah. Yeah. I. It's pretty remote. I looked and I did not see any beach houses. This, which could have been built afterwards as well. Um, for whatever reason, built in that style on the actual property of SpaceX. I did not see any, because I was kind of wondering just yeah, where these other people were in relationship. So maybe a third of the way back toward Brownsville, there may be like a couple of businesses, there are a couple of side roads. And one I think was kind of taking advantage of where they're at. They were, it was like a campground or something that talked about viewing site or something. So. 
I mean, this is just what I saw on Google Maps. Anybody can look and see. There it is. Anybody can look and see. Oh, we're upside down. Well, <laughs> I don't know. There's a way to, if I do a, a save picture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so let's see if I can. Oh, come on now. Uh, well, because we picked it up in Brownsville, because I was kind of concerned with this whole federal government and 7,500 until March. What does that mean? March 1st or the end of March or whatever. So I talked to him and then they said, well, we've got somebody who didn't come through in their financing and they have a white one with a tow hitch available in Brownsville. How far is it from you to Brownsville? I think this person was out on the West coast or something. And I said, well, that's doable. And so I went ahead and grabbed it um, because I, like I said, I was a bit nervous about March coming up. And um, so uh, how did the question start again? I said, Oh, what did I do to it? So we drove it back. That's what I was getting at. Is we drove it back from Brownsville to here. <laughs> um, there's no. This is upside down. That's driving on the beach. We I don't know that I hit the water, but I was on the sand. Yeah, I had to take the mats out and get the sand that we brought into the car out pretty quick. But um, there's no superchargers at the Brownsville pickup location. They just have some level twos. So they get cars ready for people to pick up. But about six miles away in the HEB parking lot, there's a supercharger. And that's actually in the direction of the Boca Chica Beach. So we, the first thing we did after picking it up was went, took the car that my son and I drove down in, dropped it off at the supercharger, drove over to Boca Chica Beach. So that was the first thing we did. And then went back picked up that car, drove two cars back home. I did have PPF paint protection film put on the front half of the car. And the way the car was delivered, what I was told at the service centers, they wanted to be able to sell them in all 50 states. And New York is the most restrictive states regarding tinting. There's no tinting allowed on the driver's or front passenger window at all. So when you get the car, it looks a little odd because the back two windows and the rear glass are all very darkly tinted. In fact, it's very hard to see the paper license plate that they taped in the back window. And so at the same time I got the PPF film, I got those front two tinted to the legal maximum of Texas. But a more interesting story on the paper plate, the reason that they don't put it in the license plate holder, like dealership cars is because Texas has no dealers in Texas. So they tape it on the back glass, which is very heavily tinted, as I mentioned. So they uh, do what they can. I asked about, well, can you, can I move it down to the back? And they said, well, the police in Texas know that there are no Tesla dealers and that they can't legally put the paper plate in the license plate holder. So if you do it yourself, you might get stopped. Well, what about having it in that dark glass? Well, we know it's hard to see. You might get stopped because of that too. And sure enough, I got stopped because by the time we were coming back, it was 1 a.m. And so going around Highway 6 in the southwest side of Houston, I got stopped. And he was real friendly and it was all fine. I mean, he just couldn't see it, which is understandable because it's 1 in the morning and it's already a piece of paper with dark letters behind dark glass. So, um, yeah. So that was, no, it is a Texas paper temporary plate, but it, it's not from a dealer. And so apparently they're not allowed to put it in the license plate holder. And if, oh, the dealers are very powerful in this state. Yes. Yeah. So technically I I'm, I'm bought the car in California or, or wherever. Um, yeah, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I, you know, to me, the strangest thing is when she said, you know, 
yeah, you could do it that way, but they might stop you because the Texas police know about what they can do. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah, if it's not affixed all the way around, I've seen that. Oh, really? Okay. It's not visible at that time when it's, yeah, if, if the paper is allowed to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, do do something to to keep it from flipping up, yeah. Yeah, I fix it with all four holes. Okay, so it's now 8.50. There's no more questions. We'll stop recording. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. We will... Um... All right. Robert Trevino, we'll see you. And thanks, everybody. <laughs>